chat every single verse on YouTube on live stream. If it's not on YouTube, it's not live, doesn't count. We're going to do it on live stream on YouTube. And then one day we're going to sit back, who knows how many years from now, and have every single New Testament verse on the live stream. So far, we've already done the book of Acts, the ent entire book of Acts, the entire book of Ephesians. What else? The entire book of Revelation, the entire book of Romans, the entire book of Philippians and Colossians. And now we're doing John. So it is an undertaking, but it's enjoyable. It's fun. And we're going to jump into that tonight. If you're wondering what version we're using, we're using the New King James Version. And if you liked us putting the Bible on screen last week, it is a little bit more pressing buttons and a little more confusing for me, but it seemed to be that you guys liked it. For some of you that don't have a Bible right in front of you, you're at work, you're at school, you're wherever, you can just have it on screen. So let me know if you like that. Okay, about the book of John, quick synopsis. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you don't know, are called the Synoptic Gospels because they're very similar in their content and their approach. John, the fourth book, is not considered a synoptic gospel and it doesn't include as many events as Matthew, Mark, and Luke includes, but it has more of Jesus' teaching. And John basically, unlike the other gospel, skips over the birth of Jesus and goes right into his public ministry, which we're going to go and do tonight. John starts with John 1, which we went through last week, and then John 2, right into the public ministry of Jesus. And it's actually my favorite gospel. It's my favorite book of the Bible. It's tied between John and Revelation, which both were written by John. And this is the John that wrote the book of Revelation outside of the Apostle Paul, John wrote more books and more of the New Testament than anyone else in the New Testament. So he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, and the book of John. So if, you don't, if you're not getting the theme here, I, I really, really like John. So tonight, we are going to go into chapters 2. So if you have your Bibles, let me pull up my thing here. Let me get it on screen. Let me move my chat. If you have your Bible, open it up to John chapter 2. That's where we're going to be starting tonight on John chapter 2. And we're going to break this down. So John, let's go. John chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. I want you to note this. Okay. Jesus was invited to the wedding. Very important key there. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said, woman. What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now this could be, at the start of our teaching tonight, this could be the line, my, my motto for 2023. This is my motto, I just decided. This is my motto for 2023, and we're starting off strong tonight. Whatever he says to do, do it. Type it out in the chat. Whatever he says to do, do it. Now, I want you to notice something in verses one through two is that Jesus was invited to the wedding. Oftentimes, we want Jesus in areas of our life, but we don't invite him into those areas. We don't invite him with us to go to school, with us to go to work. What if we changed our perception in 2023? And whenever we went to school and work, we said, Jesus, I want you to go with me. Holy Spirit, I want you to be with me. I don't want to just go living my life ignoring Jesus, and then at the end of the night, be like, oh, Jesus, how's it going? Please protect my family and let no burglars or no robbers break in. We need to go to a place where we invite Jesus. Like, nobody likes going to a party uninvited. Have you been to a party uninvited? You're like, oh, it feels weird. People are like, how did you get here? You know, you kind of have that weird feeling like, you really know you weren't you weren't invited or have you ever been invited last minute like you weren't really on the original wedding invites but because like 10 people couldn't make it you got you were like the last minute invite and you go to the wedding and you know like you weren't really the first pick you were kind of like because other people canceled you got invited have you been to one of those weddings Jesus is interested in us inviting him into the areas of our life now I'm not talking about oh Jesus I invite you into my heart it's great pray that prayer but that's not a biblical reality to think that gains you salvation. That's another topic for another night. I'm not talking about that portion. I'm talking about every day having an awareness of the presence of God. Saying, Jesus, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to work with me. I want to invite you. I'm asking you, Lord, to go with me to the grocery store to go with me to my campus, to go with me to work, to my business. Like, I can't leave my house without you. So there's something about inviting him into areas of our life, giving him permission and all access to every room of our life. Saying, Jesus, you can go anywhere you want. You can go to the back room. 
It's like when you invite someone over and you gotta hurry up and clean and you kind of throw all, all the mess into a room somewhere because you know, you just wanna make the house look clean. And, uh, and sometimes we, we just only let Jesus in the living room. Like we invite him into our life, but we're like, oh, we don't really want you in the back room. We kind of just cleaned up and made it look good just because we know you're here, but don't go in the back room where there's mess and dirt. I want Jesus in every room of my life. I want Jesus in every part of my life. I want him at work with me, at school with me. I want to invite him into my marriage. I want to invite him into my family. I want to invite him into my kid's life. I want to invite him. So Jesus gets invited on Contrary to popular belief, we think Jesus was like, you know, probably boring or didn't go to parties or didn't go to birthday events or didn't go to weddings. But here we see Jesus at the wedding. Now, one commentator said this about it. Certainly Mary knew who Jesus was, even though she did not declare this wonderful truth to others. She must have been very close to either the bride or the bridegroom to have such a personal concern for the success of the wedding, or even to know that the supply of the wine was depleted. Perhaps Mary was assisting in the preparation, the serving of the meals. Mary did not tell Jesus what to do. She simply reported the problem. Jesus reply seems a bit abrupt and even maybe rude saying why are you getting involved in this but he was making it clear to his mother that he was no longer under her supervision it's likely that joseph was dead but from there on out he would be doing what the father wanted him to do so the commentator says this would be the moment that jesus transitioned from i'm under your supervision i'm under your control his mother's to now i'm doing what the father wants me to do who is the heavenly father many scholars theologians and historians believe that joseph had been dead at this point and back in those days unlike today Weddings lasted seven days, included a huge guest list, and the house was responsible for providing enough lodging and wine for the entire week. So running out of wine in this day, again, the, and the wine was much different than it is today, but I'm not going into a whole teaching on drinking. I already have that on the channel, but it was a massive embarrassment for the host to run out of wine. Now, I want you to notice, though, what she says to the servant. Because I don't just want this to be informative, historical, or the context. I want it also to be revelatory. Because she says to the servants, Mary says this, whatever he tells you to do, do it. This should be our motto for 2023. Forget that. This should be our life motto, our life sentence, our life goal. Whatever Jesus says to do. Now, who are we? We're servants of Jesus. So Mary tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. We are servants of the Most High God, and we are called as believers to do whatever Jesus says to do. If Jesus says it, I'm not gonna negotiate. I'm not going to question. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to be bitter. Like, how long are we gonna tell Jesus no when he asks us to do things? Not now, Jesus. I don't have time, Jesus. I'm too busy. Now, many of you in the chat here tonight would say, I've never told Jesus no, or I'm too busy, or I don't have time. But remember, actions speak louder than words. And our actions declare to God I don't have time to pray, I don't have time to read, I don't have time to fast, and I don't have time to do whatever you tell me to do. So why do we want God to keep telling us to do things when every time he tells, am I preaching to somebody tonight? Every time he tells us to do things, we don't do it. And so Mary says, whatever he says to do, not if it's okay with your schedule, not if you feel like it, not if you want to. I've come to find that oftentimes when God speaks, it's unorthodox, it's out of the ordinary it's not part of my agenda it's uncomfortable like lord i want you to speak to me please lord and then he says to do something uncomfortable i'm like oh, i didn't really want you to say that but it's it's all about whatever he says to do it's not about what you want to do we already know that you want to be comfortable we already know that we're lazy that we're complacent as humans our flesh doesn't want to do anything that god wants us to do but we need to do whatever he says to do. As a servant, it's time to stop telling Jesus no. It's time to stop telling Jesus no. We've done this for too much of our life and we need to stop doing this. Okay, John, I got a lot to preach tonight. Six, let's go six through 10. Now there were set there six water parts, pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water parts, water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have gotten drunk, when, then the inferior wine, you have kept the good wine until now. This is about saving the best wine till last. So these stones, maybe you didn't know this, but these stones 
were common in Jewish houses. The, these stone jars were not like an uncommon thing. They probably borrowed some of the best looking ones. You wanted to make a good impression. So they had like better looking jars and lesser looking jars. And, and the Jewish people use these to wash their hands and they'd pour water over them after each eating and before each eating. So this was like a way of cleaning your hands, washing your hands. The ritual cleansed them from both physical dirt and symbolic dirt from touching objects and people that had bad influences or religiously unclean. So for example, if you went out into the world and you touched Gentiles and you were involved in unclean things and you shook hands with people, you would be considered religiously unclean. So the cleaning of the water was not just a physical thing like them washing their hands with these pots. It was a ceremonial cleaning thing. And normally the hosts serve the best wine at the beginning of the gathering. Although one commentator says the Jewish people did not condone drunkenness, they saved the inferior wine for later when the guest's taste bud had been dulled from the drinking. Thus, the master was surprised with the quality of wine that was made. Here's what another commentator said. Jesus did not need the servant's help to perform the miracle. He could have filled the jars with wine without them first filling them with water. But Jesus, listen to what this commentator said, chose to include people in his work just as he does now. He uses us in small and large roles when we obey him to accomplish his purposes and demonstrate his power to the world. So here's the truth about the story. Jesus uses people, par their participation to do the supernatural. When Jesus is saying, draw the water, pour the water, do this, he did not need them to do that. Just like when he gave the disciples the fish and the loaves, he blessed them. And the Bible says, as the disciples distributed them, they multiplied. He didn't need the disciples to distribute them, but Jesus uses people. Jesus uses servants to perform miracles. And that's, the st that's still the same today. Well, regardless of what the cessationist false doctrine teach or the religious false doctrine teaches, the miracle power of God is living on the inside of us and God desires to use you to heal his people. God desires to use you to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is the plan of God. Now, if you look at it from a representation point of view, water represents natural or normal. Wine represents supernatural, the Holy Spirit, the outpouring, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, the best wine for last. So this is Jesus turning water into wine is taking the natural into supernatural. And I don't know about you, where you came from or what you, God's done in your life, but Jesus absolutely has turned my water into wine. Jesus took my natural, normal, average life, turned it into a supernatural life. The, the wine represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that our God saves the best wine for last, that we are in the days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus takes our normal, natural, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, elevates us to a supernatural plane. We're now living on a supernatural playing field. We now go from normal natural beings. He takes our normal average life, pours out his spirit and turns our water into wine. And now we live this glorious supernatural existence where we could cast out devils. We could preach the gospel. We could lay hands on the sick. That we have supernatural authority. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, uh, gifts of healing, gifts of faith, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. We have all these supernatural abilities, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that the Spirit distributes and manifests, and no longer do we live natural, normal lives, but we've been given the supernatural life, the supernatural anointing by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the authority of the Holy Spirit, we have this. So be grateful that he's turned your water into wine. The same thing that he did then, Jesus is still doing today. Look at John 2, 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I want you to notice this. This is the beginning of the signs, his first public miracle. Scholars say his first miracle. Some teach, well, he did miracles when he was a boy. That's not biblical. We don't know that. This was his first public miracle. The beginning of signs Jesus did manifesting his glory. So he's manifesting. And then look at the result of that. His disciples believed in him. Now, we know that not every miracle Jesus performed was recorded while he was on earth. Instead, John picks specific miracles to teach specific things. If you look at John chapter 20, and I'm just going to skip way far ahead for a moment. This is what John said in John chapter 20. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So he says there's many other things Jesus did. He even goes on to say that if, if everything Jesus did was in the Bible, it would take up the whole world. But then he says these signs were written, 
And here's why, that you may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you may have life in his name. So because of these miraculous signs that Jesus was doing, the effect was his disciples believed in him. Very, very important to know. Let's go John 2, 12 through 17. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, so Jesus, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Now we're going to go into Jesus cleanses the temple. Now the Passover, look at this, of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, very important, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to them who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Okay, look at what happens here. Jesus during Passover. Now, if you don't know what Passover was, Passover was something that was in remembrance of the plague that happened in Egypt. When the angel of death would come, the, the blood of the lamb would be over the doorpost of their house and the angel of death would know that they were God's chosen, God's called because they had the lamb's blood over the doorpost and the angel of death would pass over. So Passover celebration, people from all over the world were coming into Jerusalem to celebrate how God has delivered them and saved them. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of celebrating our deliverance and our salvation out of Egypt. It was something that the people would gather and, and commemorate once a year, how God used Moses to deliver his people when that angel of death came over. Now, God told the people, listen, everyone's going to be judged. Everyone else is going to suffer. Everyone who has rejected me and is not in my kingdom will suffer. But he told the children of Israel, I'm going to pass over you. When that angel of death comes, I will pass over. Death will touch everybody else, but you will be saved. And the way they're going to know this is you're going to put blood over the doorposts of your house. Friend, we are living in a new covenant now. We don't live in that old covenant where we have lamb's blood over the doorpost of our house. Now we have the last lamb's blood, who is Jesus Christ. His blood is over the doorpost of our life. Now death has no power. You are marked by the blood of Jesus. You've been marked by the blood of the lamb. I'm grateful that even when I was in the world, I had parents that were pleading the blood of Jesus over my life. Even in Egypt, if the kids weren't believers or didn't know God, the parents could put the blood over the doorpost of the house and it would spare the family. And so don't stop pleading the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of your kid's life. Maybe your kid's out there right now on drugs or maybe they're out there lost or maybe they're out there broken or maybe they're out there hurting, but you need to keep pleading the blood. It's a glorious thing, friend, to have the blood of Jesus on our life. We are marked by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says those that are in Christ will never taste death. Friend, one day we are going to shed out of this body and it's a glorious thing. Death is not scary. There's no condemnation. There's no hell. There's no torment for us. We're going to get a brand new body and enter into a place of rest because we're covered by the blood. And this is not something that we celebrate once a year. We celebrate this every single day that death has passed over, that Jesus said, death, where is your sting? We've been redeemed. We say, thank you, God, for bringing us out of Egypt. Thank you for breaking the power of the enemy. Thank you for delivering us from the snare of Pharaoh. From the snare of Pharaoh. Now, not only would the angel of death see the blood of the, on the doorpost, but everybody else, all the neighbors, all the people around could visibly see that this house, are y'all are y'all tracking with me, type one, that this house was marked by the blood of Jesus. And the new covenant, my, te my question is, do people see that you're marked? Do people see the blood of Jesus on your life? Do people see that you've been given and received deliverance? Could they see the breakthrough power on your life, the testimony? Because I, I don't just want to be marked in secret. I don't just want the blood over my life in secret. I want my neighbors. I want my family. I want my friends. I want the city to know I'm marked by the blood. I want them to know I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm in covenant with God. There has to be a difference between us and the Egyptian people. And again, I'm using a parallel here if you're tracking with me. There has to be a difference between the way I live and the way they live without telling them. Without telling them. I shouldn't have to go around, I'm a Christian. They should see at work, I'm marked. They should see, man, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about you, Joyce. I don't know what it is about you, Miranda, John, Holly. There's there's just something different about you. I don't I can't put my finger on it, but you don't respond in anger the way everyone else does. You don't respond to tragedy the way everyone else does. You don't respond to things that happen to you and people mistreat you and people badmouth you and everybody's talking dirty and cussing and 
going about their life in their own way, but you, you're like different about you and I don't know what it is, but it's the blood of Jesus on my life. It's I've been marked by the blood of the lamb. There has to be a difference in the way that we live. Now it says in the temple, Jesus saw. Jesus is not blind to what's happening in our modern day churches. The temple is the place where the presence of God dwelled and people would go and worship. Now, very important, there was only one temple in the Jerusalem. There, there's a difference between the temple and the synagogue. The synagogue was where 10 Jews or, or more were, were built. So if there was 10 Jews or more, they would build a synagogue and they would teach, teach each other in the synagogues. And those synagogues everywhere. The temple was a special place. It was a holy place. It was the place where you came prepared. It was not a casual place. You know, we often go to church very casual, very complacent, acting like, you know, God's no big deal. This was not the way that it was supposed to be. The, the temple was a holy place of worship, of reverence, where we, go, we would go and praise the Most High God. And in the church today, the church is not really a place of reverence. It's not really a place of holiness. It's a commonplace. The Church of America has lost its authority. It's lost its holiness. It's lost its fear for God. We all have been guilty of, including me, casually walking into church unprepared to worship, unprepared to praise, unprepared to give God our best. And this was no different than what was happening there. And Jesus saw, the Bible says, what was happening in the temple. Jesus wasn't blind to it. We think Jesus doesn't see our complacency. We don't think Jesus sees our, our compromise and our sin. We have lost, friend, we have lost the fear of God. We are casual in the American church. We are no longer afraid of judgment. We are no longer, we, we do not have the fear of the Lord. And if you look at Revelation chapter three, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we've taken that verse where Jesus is outside the door of the church, knocking to get back in. And we say, oh, that's Jesus knocking on our heart. No, no. It's not Jesus knocking on our heart. There's no heart in that verse. There's no heart anywhere in that chapter. It's about churches that have rejected Jesus, lived in compromise, been lukewarm, and Jesus says, I'm knocking. I'm knocking. I wonder if we even could tell that the presence of God is no longer in most churches. Now it's just casual. It's okay to drink and party and sleep around and cuss and be casual and laugh at the altar and text at the altar. And there's just no standard anymore. And, and the moment you start preaching this, they're going to take this video, clip it up. Isaiah Sheldavar is preaching works based. Don't get mad at me that you're lukewarm. Don't get mad at me that you're in compromise and you want to do this once saved, always say false doctrine so that you can live in sin and think you're still going to heaven. Some of you out here are like once saved, always saved, live however I want. Of course you love that doctrine because you still want to sleep around. You still want to watch porn. You still want to cuss. You still want to lie. You still want to watch all those demonic garbage movies and you want to be saved too. So you could have once saved, always saved. You could have all your sin and still have salvation and go to heaven. Everybody wants once saved, always saved. The problem is it's not the case. Here we see Jesus driving people out of the temple and they don't even recognize him. If, if Jesus showed up in our churches, would we even recognize him? It's like that show Undercover Boss where the CEO goes undercover and they don't recognize him. Jesus, the Messiah, shows up to this temple and no one even recognizes him. They're so casual. They're so casual. And the Bible says he made a whip and drove them out. This is not the cute little Jesus that you hear about at church. This just brought anger to Jesus. How they, how, what they turned the church into. They turn it into this place that had a lack of worship, a lack of commitment, a lack of passion, this easy gospel. And Jesus has emotions and drives them out. Now, we, we, we try to drive people into the church. Jesus drove people out of the church. This is the, this is the reality. We're begging people come to church. Jesus was driving them out of the temple for very specific reasons. Very specific reasons. Now, also, I want you to notice this. We are what now? temples of the Holy Spirit. So the thieves were in the temple. Jesus comes with a whip, drives them out of the temple. Okay. Drives them out of the temple. Take that into a new covenant mindset. Think of this spiritually. The Bible says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That no longer does God dwell in physical temples. He dwells in humans and us. So if Jesus drove out these thieves from the temple, how much more does Jesus want to drive out 
things from our life. If we're the temple and there's things in our life that steal, like the demons that try to live in us, Jesus comes into our life and Jesus drives out those spirits as we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful that he drove things out of me. I got saved and several days later, I had some demons that needed to get driven out and Jesus drove the demons out of me. I'm grateful for that. We are his dwelling place and he drives these things out. I believe tonight he's going to drive out anxiety. He's going to drive out depression. He's going to drive out anger. He's going to drive out loneliness, worthlessness, insecurities, addictions, dysfunctions. Everything that we're going through, Jesus desires to drive these things out that are stealing from us, that are taking from us. Now, specifically, they had merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves and people exchanging money. So what they were doing was instead of people having to raise their own animal, they're supposed to have a, a spotless lamb. They're supposed to raise it and travel with it. It was a lot of energy work and keyword type this in the chat sacrifice. What they were doing was they were just selling sacrifices. So you didn't have to travel with the sacrifice. They basically, this sounds so I'm just like describing the American church. They basically were making it easy for people to sacrifice easy for people to give an offering to atone for their sins. So instead of paying a price, instead of laying down their, their, their animal, their lamb, they're going to make it easy. They're going to make it, you know, this will be good enough. This is not what Jesus requires of me, but it's going to be good enough. And this is the mentality of the American church. We have pastors that are no different than these thieves in the temple that are making it easy for you. Oh, that's good enough. You don't have to do very much. You don't have to lay down your life. You don't have to die to self. You don't have to pick up your cross. We're just saved by grace. You don't have to do anything. So pastors now make it easy. This is what they were doing. They were making it easy by selling animals and sacrifices, thinking it was good enough. Now, why did the people think that this would be okay? Why did the people think that it was going to be okay to buy an animal instead of raising it and putting the effort in? Because the leaders told them it was. The leaders told them your cheap sacrifice is enough. But I came to tell you, no, it's not. God wants everything. He wants our life. And there's still a narrow road. There's still a narrow road. God is still looking for people that would say, I'm giving you everything. I want to lay my life down for you. So they were selling sacrifices. Are you guys tracking to make it easy? And they were exchanging money. Okay. Because they only accepted shekels. So people were coming with Roman currency. Look at this worldly currency and exchanging it for what was acceptable, which was a shekel. And this is what we do in the church. We take worldly things and exchange them and try to make them godly. We try to make songs that are ungodly, godly. We try to make drinking, which is ungodly, godly. We try to make programs that are ungodly and movies. And we have, you know, series of night at the movies at the church where we take these ungodly, unholy, wicked movies, and we try to make them into sermon illustrations. Let me, let me say this. I, I got to tread lightly here. If your pastor, okay, I'm going to go there. Do you, do you want me to go there? If your pastor needs Iron Man or the Avengers or Marvel or Mr. Strange or whatever movie you can think of to come up with a sermon, it might be time to find a new church. If your pastor needs movies and culture and ungodly movies and series and programs and slangs and catchphrases, it's probably time to, we don't need to look to Marvel or movies for night at the movies and sermon series. We can look to the word of God. It's time to stop taking ungodly things, exchanging them and trying to turn them holy. And then we say, oh, we're just redeeming it. No, you can't redeem things that are demonic that God doesn't want to redeem something. It means to buy it back. We don't want to buy these things. We don't, that's like saying, well, I'm just going to redeem the Ouija board. What are you talking about? We don't want to redeem the Ouija board. We don't want to redeem these demonic movies and culture. We don't want to exchange the currency of this world for the currency of the kingdom. So that was one big thing. Not only that, they were taking up, no, this is good preaching tonight. I told you we're going long. They were taking up space in the area where you're supposed to be worshiping. There were things taking up space. So they couldn't worship God properly. There were tables selling doves, tables selling animals, tables exchanging money. And in the place where they were supposed to be worshiping, they were distracted with all the things taking space. Is this not the American church? We have all of these programs and outreaches and picnics and strategies and services and this and that. 
taking up space from what really matters, and that's the presence of God. We have so much in the church, but no prayer, no prayer meetings. So my question is, what is in your life taking up the space that God wants? Stuff blocking you from worshiping, blocking you from praising, blocking you from loving God, blocking you from giving everything to God. What is blocking you? What is in the way? We all only have a limited amount of space. It's called 24 hours in the day. And the problem is we have so many things in the place of where we should be worshiping. We should be praising. Are you all catching it? We should be dancing and worshiping and praising, but instead we have TikTok in the way. We have Instagram in the way. We have social media and Netflix and our job and our family and our career and this and that and this Friday now we go here and the sports here and this, that and the program and we have this for and all these things in the space where God says you should be pray, praying there. You should be worshiping there. Get your priorities straight. Get the presence of God straight in your life. Not only that, it was a lucrative business. Let's just be honest. People were using God to make money. This is where we're at in America. Church is a lucrative business now where we are just using God to make money. Many pastors are hirelings. They're just there for a profession. And John 10 tells us all about this. He says the hireling runs when the wolf comes. They don't fight. They don't war for the wolf. As leaders, we're supposed to fight for you. We're supposed to protect you. We're supposed to help get you delivered, help get you where you need to be. But the hireling in John 10, the fake pastors, when the wolf comes, when the warfare comes, the Bible says they run and they abandon the sheep. Now, some of you go to your pastor like, pastor, I need freedom. I need prayer. And your pastor walks off. He abandons you. And then the next verse in John 10 tells us why, why they abandon you because they're hirelings and they're only in it for money. They're not in it for God. They're not in it because they want to really serve God and want to, you know, live holy and train you and teach you. They're just in it for the money. They're in it for a quick buck. That's why the church interviews, they don't ask you if you have a prayer life, if you live holy. All they care about is, are you good looking? Do you talk good? Do you know how to network? Do you know how to run websites? Are you good on social media? You go to a church interview today, nothing about spirituality. Okay, I'm just exposing all of it tonight. Nothing about prayer, nothing about holiness, nothing about what do you do, what do you watch, what, what's your standard. All it's about is, are you good with people? Are you good at speaking? Are you good at networking? Are you good at golfing? Come on, dude, what is that? We need men of God. We need questions like, what does your prayer life look like? Do you know God? Do you live a life of holiness and worship before God? Are you consecrated? Have you been set apart do you walk holy? What does your family think? Do you pray? Like, what is the standard? It's so low in the church right now. And so Jesus comes and overturns the table. And I believe, friend, that Jesus is turning tables once again. God is calling the uneducated, the unqualified. He's turning the tables on religion. The tables are turning. And I believe holiness is going to be a driving force in the church again. I believe the supernatural is going to go from being abnormal to normal. I believe that the tables are turning and that miracles are going to be normal in this next move of God. I believe that the presence of God is coming back to the church. I'm praying that the tables would turn on the enemy and that the church would turn the tables on the devil. Come on. Somebody needs to turn turn the tables tonight. No more addiction. I'm turning the tables on addiction. I'm turning the tables on depression. I'm turning the tables on bitterness, on resentment, on anxiety. Satan, you are a liar. The tables of unforgiveness are being turned. I'm flipping them upside down. I'm not living this way anymore. Turn the tables tonight. The tables are turning. That means guys that preach deliverance are no longer going to be the weird ones. Friend, we're making deliverance mainstream and the religious people hate it. The heresy hunters hate it. The tables are turning. Religion is no longer going to be the biggest thing. The cessationist movement is dying. And all these cessationists are crying, oh no, the charismatic movement's growing. No, because they're losing. People are tired of hearing about what God isn't doing. People are tired of hearing about what God doesn't do today. So cessationists, the, the movement's dying, the charismatic movement is growing, and the tables are turning now. And religion will no longer be the growing force in the church, but revival, a move of the Spirit, the reality of God on the earth, repentance, holiness, is going to be passion, passion. This is one thing these cessationist movements don't have, is passion. And guess what? The tables are turning. People are going to be passionate. And they hate this because they can't stop it. 
the doorkeepers, the guards, the old guard of the church that told us we couldn't pray for the sick, we couldn't cast the devil, they can't stop us now. Because of the internet, the word of God is going out and people can't stop it and they hate it. But guess what? The tables are turning. So Jesus does that. Then Jesus chases the animals out, the offerings that we're bringing in. These fake cheap offerings, Jesus chased them out. He drove out their fake sacrifices and then says, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. You've turned the church into a marketplace. You're selling the gospel. Come to our church. We have the best coffee bar. Come to our church. We have the best lobby. We have the best sermons. We have the best pastor. We have the best vacation Bible school. We have the best college. We have the best gym. We have the best this, the best that. It's a marketplace. We literally advertise our church has this come here and we're, we're selling the gospel like it's some product. Like, I, I don't understand this friend. The day's coming where we're going to start saying, come to our church. We have God. That's what I want to know. I don't care about your coffee shop and your donuts and your restaurant and your gym. Come to our church. We have God. We have the fire of God, the presence of God. We have prayer meetings. We have expectation. We have deliverance. We'll pray for you. We have baptisms. That's what we want you to come for. But no, we've turned it into a marketplace. And then Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Look at this. He correlates. Now you got to just stay with me here. I'm not trying to go so deep that you need scuba gear, but just stay with me. He correlates. My house should be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. So he correlates prayer with stealing from people. Here's my revelation. Okay. If you don't pray, listen to me closely tonight. If you don't have a real connection with God, if pastors are not in their prayer closet, they are robbing people from an encounter with God. They are robbing people from what God wants to do in their life because the sick come into our church and because of our lack of prayer, the sick don't get healed. We're robbing them. The depressed come in, they don't get delivered. The addicted come in, they don't get free. They come in with depression and they don't get joy because we don't pray. We've turned the father's house, which should be a house of prayer, into a den of thieves and we're robbing from the people their God-given encounter. But we need to be a church that prays. Not a side ministry off in the corner, but a house of prayer a place that prays, a place that worships, a place that knows God. Now let's look at what did the temple look like, excuse me, after Jesus left. It was an absolute mess. It was a mess before he came, but it looked like they had it all together. And it was a mess after he left, but it was all put back together. This was holy chaos. And this is why pastors don't want Jesus to show up to their church because Jesus does not come nicely. He comes and turns tables, there's coins everywhere, there's animals running out, there's people running out, and Jesus is chasing them with a whip, driving them out with a whip. And the pastors say, we want revival and the move of God. And then people start getting delivered, vomiting on the carpet, people start screaming, people start getting healed. And the pastors are like, oh, we didn't really want that Jesus. You wanted the Jesus of your own imagination of the American church but you didn't want the Jesus of the Bible because when the Jesus of the Bible shows up, he makes a mess of our marketplaces. He makes a mess of our compromise. He makes a mess of the lukewarmness of the church. John 2, 18. I can't help but preach this, guys. I don't want to tell you. John 2, 18 through 22. So the Jews answered and said to him, I mean, now, now he says, zeal for my father's house is eaten up. The disciples remember that. The Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Like, who gives you the right to do this? That's what they're saying. Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy, very important. Picture, picture Jesus pointing back at himself. He wasn't, but just picture it, okay? Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Then Jesus, then the Jews, look at this, said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So we're already seeing that the, the imagery here that the body is the temple the temple the new covenant the body is now the temple which paul will tell us later but jesus tells us here or the uh, john tells us here therefore when he had risen from the dead his disciples re disciples remembered that he said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which jesus had said so jesus was saying listen even though it took 46 years to build destroy this temple and i'll rise up now he's speaking of his resurrection that's what he's speaking of. His body's the temple and he's speaking of his resurrection. But also he's saying everyone's replaceable. 
Like, don't say that you're children of Abraham because God can turn these stones into children of Abraham. So don't think because you're Pharisees, you've been here for years, God won't remove you and build something else. God can, God can make the whole world in six days. God can definitely rebuild this temple when it gets t torn down. And I also want to note something that they had in the temple. They had the dove in cages. We know that the dove represents, because we know this, because last week we went over this, the dove represents the Holy Spirit. So they had the dove in cages as a prophetic sign also of the Holy Spirit being caged up. They locked up the dove. They caged up the Holy Spirit. And no longer did the Holy Spirit tell us what to do. But in America, we tell the Holy Spirit what to do. And in the Church of America, the dove is in a cage. We cage up the Holy Spirit. We say, you got to go with our agenda. You got to go with what we're doing. And the dove is caged up. But God is saying, time to let the dove out. It's time to uncage. Let the Holy Spirit out. Stop locking up the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, just to recap here, first week of his ministry. This is the first week of his public ministry. He cleanses the temple. And then the book of Matthew, the last week of his ministry, he cleanses the temple again. So Jesus did this twice in his ministry. The first week, deliverance and cleansing of the temple. The last week, deliverance and cleansing of the temple. The goal is keep the temple clean because from the beginning of him cleaning the temple to the end of him cleaning the temple, somebody recluttered the temple. And I don't want to go back to my addictions. I don't want to go back to my dysfunction. I don't want to go back to the clutter. When God cleans our temple, when God delivers you, when God drives the thieves out, when God restores you, do not go back. Do not go back. John 2, 23. Let's go through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. Okay. So they believed in him. Very important here. And I want to keep it practical, but Jesus did not believe in them. Okay. Cause he knew their hearts. So they believed in his name. Many, I'm sorry. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs. So why did they believe when they saw the signs, which he did? This is why they believe it was a superficial believing. We're not really believing you because you're the Messiah. We're believing you because we've seen signs and wonders and miracles. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew that what was in man. There's a lot of translations. Some say he knew their heart. He didn't trust in them even though they trusted in him. They were believing for a political king, not a spiritual savior. Jesus came to deliver them from sin, not the Roman Empire. So they believed in him as a political savior. Oh, you're going to deliver us from Rome. You're going to deliver us from Pilate. They thought he's going to come deliver them from the grip of Rome. But Jesus says, I'm coming as a spiritual savior. So although they believed in him superficially, like many of us, he didn't believe in them. There was a conditional trust they had. We trust Jesus because he blesses us. Or maybe you trust Jesus because your boyfriend saved or your girlfriend saved or your family's in the church. So you trust in Jesus or because you're not sick in body or maybe because the person you like or maybe you saw a miracle or maybe you saw someone that had cancer get healed. So it's I trust you, Jesus, because of this. It's a because of type of faith. And I'm trying to keep it simple here. But here's the thing. The problem with trusting Jesus conditionally is when the conditions change, you lose trust in him. So the girlfriend leaves you, you no longer trust in Jesus because the only reason you trusted him is because she trusted in him or your family leaves or you get sick again or your friend goes back to the world or you lose your job or you lose your blessing or things don't go the way you want them to go. And so now you go from, I trust you because of this to I no longer trust you. We need unconditional trust in Jesus. We need to move to a place where we trust him because he's God. I don't need a reason. I don't need a blessing. I don't need a miracle. I don't need deliverance. I don't need a healing. I don't need a sign or a confirmation. I walk by faith, not by sight. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Neither has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. I don't need to see it with my eyes. If I never see another sign, if I never see another miracle, if I never see another deliverance, I'm still going to trust in him. If he saves me from the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If he saves me from the fire, great. But if he doesn't, I still won't bow to you. This is where we need to be because here's the thing. I can't rush through this. This can't be two months that you get sir, you save, you serve God. This can't be six months. You're all excited. You found the broadcast. You get saved. You're at church. And then six months later, you go back. And then three months later, friend, this is not like a, a, a six month thing. This is not like a, a five month vacation. This is till you breathe your last breath. I am serving a life sentence to the one that gave me life. I'm talking about like, we cannot be a flash in the pan. 
We got to keep going for this thing. Even when it's not popular to follow Jesus. Do you know many countries, it's not popular to follow Jesus like it is in America, but we still serve him. We still praise him. We still worship him. And the Bible says no one needed to tell him he knew mankind. He knew how fickle they were. He knew how back and forth they were. Some of you are like, I don't want my pastor or my wife or my girlfriend or my husband to find out about this. Jesus already knows. He already knows everything about you. You don't need to hide it. He knows already what you're going through. He knows your sin. He knows your pride. He knows your struggle. He knows your addiction. Nobody needs to tell him. He already knows the heart of man. Let's just stop acting like he doesn't know. Let's just stop acting like he can't see our sin. He can't see our compromise. Here's the beauty. The fact that he knows you. Nobody else knows you the way he knows you, but he still extends grace to you. He still extends mercy to you. It's like when we were watching The Chosen last night. Judas, who's in charge of the money. Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him, yet he still extends mercy and grace to Judas. This is the beauty of our God. God already knows. There's nothing you can do about it. God already knows. Okay? Let's go into here. Let's go into John chapter 3. We're moving here. I know we're 45 minutes in. I'll try to go like 20, 30 on this. We'll get it through as quick as we can. The beginning will take the longest, and then the end is very self-explanatory. We won't go long in it. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Last Monday of the year, so let's just go for it here. Verse 1. There was a man, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God. For no one can do these signs unless, no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, a Jewish religious leader, a religious teacher. This man, like many of us tonight, knew all about Jesus, the prophecies. He knew all about him, but didn't know him. He knew all about the law. He knew all about the, the prophecies in Isaiah about the coming Messiah. He knew all the scriptures. He knew all the doctrine. He knew all the Bible commentaries. He was like head knowledge, head knowledge. There's a lot of these guys out there, but he didn't actually know the person of Jesus Christ. He had a picture of Jesus, of who Jesus might have been, but didn't know him truly. And like Nicodemus, some of us have an image of God, but it's not the right image. I had an image of God that was wrong for so long. I thought God was one way growing up in the church, but to realize he isn't the God that I learned about and thought I knew. I did this for so long. A guy like Nicodemus where on the outside, he has everything going on, uh, everything going together, but everything might look fine on the outside, but on the inside, Nicodemus is struggling with questions of life. There's a void inside of him. There's hurt inside of him. There's questions inside of him. There's an emptiness about him coming at night, a, a Pharisee, desperate for to find out who is this man and is this the coming messiah now how many people in the church look good like nicodemus on the outside they know the laws they know the standard they have this exterior but no one knows that they're hurting no one knows there's questions nobody knows there's an emptiness this is nicodemus everything going on on the outside but but questioning who jesus is questioning the purposes of life like many of us sat at, sitting up at night looking saying i know there's more than just the law i know there's more than just religion i know there's more than just what the pharisees teach there has to be something to this because this guy's doing miracles and signs and wonders now nicodemus was high up in the, in the pharisees world he had probably a personal assistant yet he didn't send an assistant to inquire about jesus he came personally and this is something that we need to do to Jesus, with Jesus. Don't send your friend. Don't send your cousin. Don't live your life through a family member. Get to know Jesus personally. Get to know Jesus on a personal level. I know some of you, you know, you only go to church because you have to, because your family goes, your friends go, or your coworker goes, or your grandparents go. But get to know Jesus personally. And Nicodemus also comes at night. He comes undercover. He's an undercover believer. And this is many of us, we're living undercover. We want a relationship with Jesus. We want to talk to Jesus. We want to question Jesus, but we don't want no one to know. We don't want no one to know that we're a believer. We don't want no one to know that we're a Christian. So we come under the cover of Sunday morning. We go on Sunday morning. We worship and praise. Then we live all week long embarrassed about Jesus, ashamed about Jesus, not wanting nothing to do with Jesus. And then we come, out, we come out from the cover of dark and then we go worship Jesus. We're hiding in the dark. Like Nicodemus, we're hiding in the nighttime and God is saying it's stop, time to stop covering up your light with a basket. 
Why are we covering up our light? What are we ashamed of? We need to stop just only praying for people in church, only witnessing in church. Come out, come out of the closet. The whole world is celebrating coming out of the closet, yet the church hides a shame. Midnight Christians, midnight Christians hiding in the darkness, secret Christians living in the dark. I'm not a secret Christian. Okay, how many people have you witnessed to in the last year? How many people know that you're a Christian because of your lifestyle? Do you even share with anybody? And the answer for a lot of us is no. Okay, so we're midnight Christians. We're coming at night. We're coming at night. Doesn't matter how successful you are, we're coming at night. He says, teacher, we know God sent you to teach us because of the signs that you've done. This is the American gospel. The American gospel says Jesus is just a teacher. He's natural. He's normal. He doesn't have supernatural power. Friend, we've lost the conviction of sin. We've lost the crying out in repentance. We've lost the holiness of God. The church of America, I can only speak for my country because I've been all over this country, 35 plus states, hundreds of churches. It's the teacher Jesus. The main denominations, they don't believe in the supernatural part of Jesus. They don't believe the signs and wonders part of Jesus. They believe that Jesus is a teacher, teacher, teacher. So what do we have in the church now? Teaching, teaching, teaching. Most churches are ran by teaching. You listen to a teaching for 30, 40 minutes, there's no demonstration, there's no deliverance, there's no miracles, there's no power of God, there's no born again experiences, there's no supernatural, there's no signs and wonders, it's just teaching, 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 and it's like Nicodemus teaching, teacher, 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 but Jesus is more than just a teacher. He's not only here to teach us. And look at what Jesus says here. Look at what Jesus says here. Luke, uh, John, we're not in Luke, okay, we're in John 3, 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you. So he does, Jesus doesn't even answer his question. Look what he says. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said what that I said to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Okay, Nicodemus, like many of us, is trying to rationalize the gospel, trying to rationalize the kingdom of God. And the Bible clearly says you cannot see the kingdom if you're not born again. It doesn't matter how many books you've read, how many conferences you go to, how hard you try, don't waste your time arguing with people that are not born again because they will not understand the spiritual kingdom of God, the spiritual realm. They can't see it. They can't perceive it. You must be born again. The kingdom of God is a real kingdom with a king, with a hierarchy, with an army, with servants. And once God opens up your eyes to the spirit and you're born again, you can't unsee it. But what religious people do is they try to rationalize the supernatural. They try to explain away the kingdom of God. And when I got saved, God opened my eyes to the spirit and I can't ever go back. Why? Because I was born again. I remember when I was born again, January 12th, 2011, I cried. I cried and cried and cried. I would go outside and cry. The grass was greener. It was like being in 360p standard definition to 4K. Everything was greener. Everything was brighter. It was like I saw color for the first time. I was a new creature. I was born again. Can anyone testify? Isaiah, what do you, how can you explain it? I can't. It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Now, this would have been a perfect time. Please, everybody hear me tonight. This would have been a perfect time for Jesus to say, oh, Nicodemus, you want to be saved? Okay, excuse me. You want to be saved? Okay, pray the sinner's prayer. Invite me into your heart. Now, if Nicodemus was in the church today, we would say, oh, Nick, just, you know, pray a prayer, invite Jesus in your heart. Did Jesus tell him, invite me in your heart? No, Jesus said, you must be born again. And the church is full of people that have never been born again because we don't tell them to. We just tell them, just pray a prayer, do these three steps, but it's a gift of God to be born again. Just like you don't choose when you're born, you don't get to choose when you're born again. It happens when you submit yourself to God, when you repent and turn to Jesus and believe in him for salvation, you are born again. It's not striving. It's not working it up. It's a product of receiving the gift of salvation. Now, again, Nicodemus is trying to understand carnally. How can I go back into my mother's womb? This is what happens when God gives us a word. We try to rationalize it and we try to make it a carnal reasoning. 
We try to understand it intellectually. And this is what guys do. They don't understand deliverance. They don't understand Christians having demons. They don't understand miracles. They don't understand the supernatural. So they try to rationalize. Well, if God heals, why don't you empty a hospital? They're trying to rationalize the supernatural. They're trying to rationalize what God is doing. But the kingdom goes far above intellect, far above your own understanding. Stop trying to figure out God. If God says it, we just believe it. A lot of stuff God said didn't make sense in scripture. What makes sense about making a boat when it had never rained? He tells Noah, make a boat. It's never rained. But by the way, it's going to rain. What makes sense about shouting at walls and the walls coming down? What makes sense about smashing jars and blowing horns and the enemies fighting themselves? What makes sense about Sarah having a kid at 100 years old? What makes sense about fishermen and tax collectors being disciples instead of Sadducees and Pharisees? What makes sense? What makes sense about an ocean opening up and then walking through on dry ground and the ocean closing and destroying a whole army? Most of it intellectually doesn't make sense. And when we try to rationalize it and make sense about it, we lose the supernatural element. So he's like, how could I go back in my mother's womb? And it's no, it's spiritual. You are born again. You're a new person. It's not a changed you. It's a new you. Well, I was just born this way. Well, you won't be born again that way. I say, I was born this. I was born that. I was born gay. I was born a liar. I was born a thief. Great. But when you're born again, you're born a new creature. You're no longer the old. I'm preaching to somebody. The old is passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So you have two birth dates. The day you are born naturally and the day you are born spiritually. Now, what does he mean when he says you must be born of water and spirit? Now, there's a big debate on this. Some say born of water is a natural birth. Like when the water breaks, the water represents natural birth. So you're born once naturally, then the second time spiritually. Some say it's water baptism. Some say the water represents the word of God, how it cleanses us. We don't fully know. In whatever case it stands for, we know that there is a spiritual birth that takes place in the life of a believer. And the born again experience is one of the best elements of the Christian faith. That you get to start over. That we've ta We talk about this a lot on this channel. You get to start over. Not as a changed person, as a different person brand new life the the old friends don't recognize you now some of you are like i don't know why when i got saved all my friends and family want nothing to do with me because they love the old you they fell in love with the old you and this is not the old you this is the new you that is born again a new creature and that's they don't like the new you because the new you isn't dirty the new you doesn't talk dirty the new you doesn't party they're mad that you won't smoke on the porch with them anymore they're mad that you don't shoot up with them they're mad that you don't drink with them and party and watch movies so they don't like you anymore because they didn't fall in love with the new you they fell in love with the old you so don't be surprised peter says when they they talk bad about you they mock you when you don't plunge into the darkness and the parties with them anymore that's the old you. Those things have passed away. You're no longer doing those things. I remember being like, I don't know why my best friend doesn't like me anymore. Well, I know why. Because I wouldn't party with them and drink with them and cuss with them and all the stuff. We, we no longer had nothing in common because I'm a new person. So I make new friends. I build new relationships. Some of you, when you get saved, that girlfriend's just not going to like you anymore. Like when I got saved, I was with a girl for four years. God said, break up with her. But it wasn't even that I had to break up with her. She wouldn't have liked the new me. Because she fell in love with the old Isaiah, the lying Isaiah, the, 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 the manipulative Isaiah, the one that had a dirty mouth, the one that was unclean. The new Isaiah was a new person. So again, you're like, I don't know why my girlfriend or boyfriend doesn't like me anymore because you're a new creature. Embrace it. Move on. Move on and find someone that's born again. So human life produces human life. But the Holy Spirit, write this down, the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. This is the difference between ministries born out of the flesh and ministries born out of the spirit. Human life is when you choose to have a baby and conceive. Spiritual life is when the spirit gives birth to that born again you, that born again experience. So we want our ministries, we want our lives to be born of the spirit. We want them to be spirit led. I didn't start my ministry. I didn't decide I want to be a minister and preach the gospel and make a channel. None of that. 2011, God called me and God birthed a ministry. The Holy Spirit birthed a ministry that I'm living out and walking out today. But we want to let the Spirit do this. We don't want to call ourselves. And then Jesus says, the Spirit is like the wind. The wind goes where it wants. The wind does where it wants. And the wind moves where it wants. You cannot tell the wind what direction to go into. You cannot tell the wind when or where to blow. It just happens. 
So the spirit moves and we don't tell it what to do. Now, if the wind blows, you can't see the wind. Okay, you can't see wind. So how do we know that wind is real? We know that wind is real when your eyes see things that react to the wind. Okay, so I can't see the wind, it's invisible. Just like the spirit, okay? But if I see a tree blowing like this, like a tree, branches moving, I know that there's wind. So the tree moving back and forth is a sign to me the reality that the, that wind is real, even though I can't see wind. So I can't see God, but believers reacting and respond, oh, this is good preaching, and responding to God are proof that God is real. So God is like the wind, invisible, you can't see it, but my life's response to that wind is what makes unbelievers know that God is real. My life is assigned to unbelievers because I respond to that wind. And it's a real thing. Like, have you ever been in worship? If you, if you invite an, a friend to church that's not a believer and, you're in, and everyone's worshiping, this is probably going to happen to them. When everyone's worshiping, they're probably going to do this. They're probably going to move back and forth. Next time you're all in worship at church or in prayer, look around and everyone's going to be doing this back and forth. Why? It's the wind. It's the wind. It's the Ruach. It's the spirit of God blowing through the room. You might not feel it. You might not see it, but your body's reacting. You ever wonder why we sway in worship or prayer? Unbelievers do this in, in worship and prayer. It's, it's the wind of God in that place, the presence of God. God inhabits the praises of his people. It's that Ruach of God. It's the Holy Spirit blowing and we respond. We respond to that wind. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit. When we pray for people, when miracles happen, when we get on our knees, lift our hands, it's the wind of the Spirit. And that's how the world knows God's real. So is God invisible? Yes. But God's invisible qualities are made known all throughout creation and everywhere we go and everything we do. Nicodemus. All right, let's go to, I got to remember to change my screen here. I'm still getting used to it. John 3, 9 through 15. Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? <laughs> Does that not like sound like a Pharisee? How? How could this be? This doesn't make sense. Jesus and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do, do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he's like, look, you don't even understand earthly things, let alone heavenly things. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in, the, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay. Now, when it talks about the serpent, he's speaking of numbers 21. I'll give it to you in a nutshell. The people were complaining and gossiping. Snakes were coming out and biting them and killing them and getting them sick. God told Moses, build a bronze serpent beat the bronze into the image of a serpent, a snake. And when you lift up the snake, the curse, the serpent, the people are going to be healed. Jesus is paralleling what Moses did in Numbers 21 to now Jesus says, I'm going to be the curse. The people are sick with the sickness of sin. And when the son of man is lifted up and people look to him, they're going to be healed of the sickness of sin and gain eternal life. So Jesus, the Bible says, became the curse. Cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. So Jesus hung on a tree, became the curse. Those that, the one that knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So in the same way Moses lifted up the serpent, you got to go to Numbers 21 to find this. I don't have time tonight. And they looked upon the serpent and were healed. Jesus, the curse would be lifted up on a tree. And when we look to Jesus, we are healed and delivered from this issue of sin. So if you're hurting tonight, look to Jesus. If you're sick, look to Jesus. If you're depressed, look to Jesus. If you're angry, look to Jesus. It's a parallel that he knows that Nicodemus is going to know. Let's go 16 through 18. All right, here we go. For God, and this is the famous verse we know. I don't even need to explain this because you guys know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then, okay, so these words here, God so loved the world God, write this down, God took action. Love was not passive. Love was not idle. God said, I love the world so much, I'm going to do something. And here's what I'm going to do. Give my only begotten son. Love is not just words. Oh, I love you. Prove it. I love the world. Prove it. Here's how I'm going to prove it. I'm going to take action. Our God is not idle. God put in work. Here's the work. He gave his only begotten son. And then here's the thing. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is like one of the best verses in all of scripture. 
Okay, but this is what people fail to quote. They fail to keep reading when they say John 3, 16. The whole world knows that God loves the world, gave his son, all that. Praise the Lord. But here's the purpose, verse 17. We're going to be very basic here tonight. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world. So the purpose of Jesus coming was not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Might. Not everybody's saved. Okay, we know this, but they might be saved. How do I get how? Believes in him. You got to believe in him. You got to put your faith in him. That's John 1, John 2, John 3. Okay, they might be saved. Not everyone will be, but some might. And then look at verse 18. This is where we don't ever read and we, we just stop here. Look at what verse 18 says, chat. He who believes in him is not condemned. And then this is where all the people are like, oh, everyone's saved. No, they're not. Look, but he who does not believe is condemned already. No one ever keeps reading because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So Jesus doesn't even need to condemn you because if you don't believe you're already under the condemnation. But what is the condemnation? Let's just go into verse 19 here. And this is the condemnation. So what is it? Here it is. Ready? This is the words of Jesus. That the light has come into the world and the men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are e were evil. So the light comes. We talked about this in John 1, but we'll just recap it here. And the men love the darkness more than they love the light because their deeds are evil. And they don't want God to expose their deeds. People love their sin. People love their darkness. And so even though Jesus came to bring life and light and healing and not condemnation, they rejected Jesus. This is the words of Jesus. No one's stronger in scripture than Jesus. Look what he says. The light comes, but the men love darkness. Father, this is me talking now. Father, I pray that I would not love darkness. We need to pray that we would not love the darkness, but we would love the light. That when Jesus comes, oh, my thing's frozen here. Hold on. We need to pray that when Jesus comes, we would love the light and not the darkness. There's too many people in the church. There's too many people in the body of Christ that loves the darkness that does not love Jesus. All right, we're back here. So let's look at, okay, so now we know that. Let's look at this. Okay, so they love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. So that's, there's a reason why. Oh, it's frozen again. Why is it not letting me scroll? Hold on, let me close out. We might have to go without it. Give me one second and let me try to open it up again. The devil is a liar. Talking about man loving darkness and I can't. Okay, here we go. Is it going to work? Is it going to work? There it is. Oops. Okay, we're back. They love darkness more than light. Temporary interruption there. Okay, for God. Okay, he believes in him. He's not condemned. And this is the condemnation. For everyone. Okay, here we go. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So those that practice evil, they hate the light. They don't just not like the light. They don't just despise the light. They actually hate the light. Have you ever preached to somebody and there's a hatred towards God and they're yelling and they're cussing and you're like, why do you hate God so much? And they don't even know why. They don't know why they hate God. America doesn't know why it resists God. The celebrities don't know why they hate God. Jesus tells us why they, why everyone practicing evil hates the light because their deeds would be exposed. Don't tell me, this is what the world says. Don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. Don't tell me that what I'm doing is sin. I want to do what I want to do. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to light, so they expose. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So if you, if you are in the truth, you love the light. You love the conviction. When God is convicting you, you love it because you're in the light. Okay, let's go to 22 through 30. This is very self-explanatory, so I'm just going to read through and teach through. We'll just go, actually, we'll just go the rest of this. And then I'll commentate as we finish here. Okay. And then we're at chapter four. We'll be in a, a couple weeks. Okay. 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and they remained with him and baptized. Now, John was also baptizing in Anan near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. This is John the Baptist here. So I'm, this is just a story here. So not a lot to talk about, but we'll commentate here. This is John the Baptist has not been in prison yet. Verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. 
You yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, the joy of mine is fulfilled. Okay, sounds kind of complicated. John is saying, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm not the bridegroom. And I'm celebrating the fact that the bridegroom's voice is here. And I'm just, I'm just a friend. I'm just here supporting him. And therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Because remember, John the Baptist, we went into detail on this on John 1, the last series. You can go watch it. John the Baptist's job is to prepare the way. It's to prepare the world for the Messiah. And then John says in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, this is not John saying, I need to humble myself like we use it in today's context. This is John saying, I, my public ministry, the spotlight is on me, okay? And now I want the spotlight to be on Jesus. So I must decrease in influence, in affluence, in spotlight. I'm the guy that's been preaching. Everybody knows me. I've been baptizing. Thousands are coming to hear me. I now need to move out of the way, decrease in my, uh, let's say, fame or my notoriety so that Jesus can take the center. J John's job is to point to Jesus. This is our job. Our job is to point you to Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ, okay? Then he says, he must increase, I must decrease. This is not about false humility. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And he's talking about Jesus being above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. This is talking about Jesus. God has sent and, and John is saying he speaks the word of God to these people that are basically saying, hey, John, there's this guy baptizing. He's taking all the glory. He's taking all the credit. He's this new thing. Who is this guy? And John's reflect, John is validating Jesus to these people in this sermon John is giving here, okay? The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand, okay? The father has given everything into his hand. And then verse 36 here. This is our last verse. He who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides in him this is the closing to john chapter 3 which makes it all very clear and summarizes this way very very clear you have two choices there's two things you can do and there's only two things there's not a third thing there's not a fifth thing there's not a second thing there's two choices okay and two choices you have tonight two choices as we pray two choices to every single person watching you are either in one or the other category there's no carpool lane there's no middle ground there's no gray area here's the two choices choice number one very simple believe in the son and have everlasting life or choice number two do not believe and the wrath of god will abide on you friend this is where we're at there is a crossroad a split crossroads here in the journey of life you choose to believe in the son and have eternal life or to reject the son. And then here's what John says at the very end, verse 36, the wrath of God will abide on you. Make that choice tonight. I don't know about you, but I want to be born again. I want to be a born again believer. I don't want to be a lukewarm, watered down. I know we went over a lot of stuff tonight. I don't want to be one of those that just treats Jesus like no big deal. I'm asking you, what is in the way of your praise and your worship? What is it? Are you one of those that Jesus would drive out of the temple? Or are you one of those that has made room for God? In 2023, this is the last message I'm going to be giving of 2022. Let us go into the next year with room for Jesus to move, with passion for his name, saying, Lord, I want to be born again. I'm tired of not sharing my faith. I'm tired of being complacent. I'm tired of being divisive. I'm tired of arguing. I want the wind of the Holy Spirit to move in my life. I want the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life. I am tired of living on the fringes of a religious system. God is saying to you tonight, it's time to get off the bench. It's time to get off the bench. It's time to get off the sidelines. You've been waiting. You've been living far too long in the sidelines. 2023. You know, when I got saved, I got saved in January. I remember the preacher said this. This one sentence changed my life. He said, do you want to be next year where you are this year? And I reflected back on the new years of every year when I was in the world. It was the same parties, the same people, the same circle, the same literally going in circles. And I realized I don't want my life to just keep being this same parties, same guys, same girls, same beer pong, same this, same waking up sick, vomiting, hungover, same. 
like some of you need a wake up call tonight and you're questioning like, man, maybe I should, you need to change your life, change. And it starts with you making the choice. I'm going to receive Jesus. I'm going to receive his name. I'm going to turn to him. I want to be born again. And friend, I was born again in January of 2011 and I've never looked back and I've never been the same. And guess what? Tonight you can be born again. You can be born again. You get a fresh start, a fresh shot at life. What message is better than that? All you have to do is just, Lord, I believe in you. I repent. I turn from my ways. Repentance means to change your mind. So you literally can't even come to him unless you first change your mind about him. You come against, I, I come against these things that are blocking me and stopping me and these voices. I just want to serve you, Lord. And wh however you need to say it, you turn to God. Not some religious, oh, come into my heart. No, I want to lay everything down. I want to pick up my cross. I want to be your disciple and I want to follow you tonight. This is your chance to turn from your wicked ways. Repent of your wicked ways. Acts 2.38, what must we do to be saved? We don't need to reinvent the will, try to re-preach it. Peter says, repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Repent, repent of your sin. Turn, change your mind. You've been wrong about God. That's what it means. You've thought God was this religious trinket that didn't really matter, it didn't have any bearing in your life. You've been wrong. You've thought wrong about God. Repent and turn to God. Turn to God. Father, I pray tonight for every person watching that's not been born again or has been born again. I pray, Lord, that you'd pour your spirit out upon them. I pray you'd pour your anointing out on them, Lord. I pray that they would turn to you. They would acknowledge that you've died. They would acknowledge that you've raised. They would put their, put their faith in your name, which is the name above every name. I pray tonight, Lord, the gift of repentance I pray, Lord, that they would be born again in Jesus' name. That this is a real spiritual experience you can have. That they would be born again in Jesus' name. Lord, tonight, do what only you can do. Tonight, do what only you can do. I pray tonight would be that you would say, December 19th, 2022, I was born again. Lord, right now, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your power. Fill them with your anointing. God, do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. We can't do it, Lord, but you can. Do the heavy lifting. I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, fill them with your Holy Spirit and empower them. Empower them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with the fire of God. Break every addiction, God. Drive out every spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would drive out every thief, every unclean spirit in their life right now. Every spirit has to go. Every spirit has to go in Jesus' name. Sickness has to go in Jesus' name. Satan, you have no power. You have no strength. The Lord rebukes you. We command you up and out in Jesus' name. Every spirit must go. Father, I pray freedom for the listeners from those watching. Freedom in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Right now in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name, do what only you can do. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Fill them with the power of God. Right now, Lord, we just pray have your way. Holy Ghost, move like never before. Move like never before. We're asking you, Jesus, touch them. Touch them, deliver them, save them, God. I'm asking you, Lord, to fill them, to send your mighty angels, according to Hebrews 1, over their house. Lord, that you gave, Father, you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Tonight, we pray, Lord, that we put our faith in you. We put our faith in you. In Jesus' name, we turn from our sin. We turn from our sin in Jesus' name. Every spirit must go. Every unclean power must go. Every demonic stronghold must be broken now. Holy Spirit, have your way. Bring healing to bodies. Bring healing to minds. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Heal and restore us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can keep praying if you're praying. What a great time. If you're listening on audio, you can join our lives on Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 6 o'clock Pacific. And you can give on our website, IsaiahSaldivar.com slash partner for those of you that are still on here if you want to sew into the broadcast again we are supported by the viewer we can't survive without you guys this is our last broadcast i'm sorry our last monday night teaching of 2022 what we're going to do let me make this very clear is we're going to be live tomorrow i'm not done yet so stay and if you want to give you can the links to give her in the comments if you're blessed tonight sew something even if it's a dollar, it goes a long way. You can give on the website. You can scan the QR code. You can give on the PayPal, Venmo. I'm going to hang out and talk and chat and do all that good stuff as well still. But right now, I'm just going to hang out with the chat. But 
what I want you guys to do is I want you to um to tune in to tomorrow night, six o'clock, the broadcast with Vlad Savchik. Fast forward, we're gonna talk about fasting. You need to hear this before you go into the next year. And then next Monday, okay, next week, we are canceling the streams. We're not gonna have no streams. I'm taking the week off. I'm gonna hang with the family and just be with the family. I rarely ever take time off. So we're gonna take next week off. But on Monday night, Sunday's Christmas, on Monday night, I'm gonna be watching The Chosen at six o'clock. So Sunday's Christmas, don't watch The Chosen Sunday. Wait for Monday. So Sunday is The Chosen, the new episode. And then Monday at six o'clock, we're gonna be watching episode three of The Chosen to, to keep on track, okay? So that's going to be on next Monday. We will not have a normal teaching, normal stream. It'll be the chosen watch party on Monday night. I was going to do no stream, but I'd rather do that. Sunday is Christmas. Be with your family, all that good stuff. Everyone's going to be in church, hopefully. I don't understand how people are canceling church on Christmas. That makes no sense to me. I'm going to be in church. I hope you're going to be in church. But be with your family, and then Monday we'll watch the chosen together, and I'll be taking that week off. And then Sunday, on um, Friday, I'll be flying to Tennessee. Saturday we'll be in Tennessee, and then Sunday which is January 1st, I will be in Tennessee and then I'll be flying home. And then January 2nd, Monday, we'll be having our first stream of 2023. And we'll try to do something special. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll do something. That's going to be a really good time. And then we're going to be working on the studio. So if you want to give, we're not doing a GoFundMe for the studio. We are spending a lot of money on this, not just to get the building, but also all the equipment is extremely expensive equipment. It's high quality stuff. So if you want to be a part of that, you can give right here, right now. And this will be going towards the studio okay this is going to be going towards the studio because we're trying to you know pay for everything and do all that and we're not going to be doing a fund and a gofundme we're not doing all that because god's providing people give but tonight you can give if you want to be a part of helping build the studio because really all of you guys are building the studio all of you guys are giving enabling us to do the new studio to get the new location to get the new cameras to get the new everything it's going to be good now for those of you worried uh let me just you know not worry all of this my studio here my teaching's like, well, I like the way you teach here. I'm going to be still doing this. This will not change. My Monday nights, I will be teaching right here in the studio still. And the uh, Tuesday nights, I'll be doing Zoom podcast still. But there will be times where I go live from the other studio. Maybe Fridays. Maybe when I have a, a speaker in town or family, I will sit down and we'll do interview. One of the interviews I want to do is my mom, my sister, my brother, my wife. I want us all to do a sit down and I want my mom and my sister to tell you guys about the early days of the revival and all that good stuff. So that's going to be another one that I want to do. Get some of my family sit down. Some of you have never seen my family before in the videos. So the sit down style will be a good chance for us to be able to sit down on the couch. It'll be more relaxed style, right? It's going to be really good though. Okay. So you guys can do that there. Where is it snowing? I need to get to some snow. Is it snowing where you guys are at here? Is it snowing where you live? Let me know. It's cold where I'm at, but not snowing. 39 degrees. Okay. Thank you so much, Richard Stevens. I'm going to read the donations. Again, you guys can give on Venmo, Zelle, PayPal, uh, website, all of that. Okay. Richard Stevens, thank you so much. Hannah, so thank you so much for everything you do. I love your teachings. My family is thankful for you. God bless. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I'm going to read, read the chat, hang out and talk as well to you guys in the chat right whenever I get done reading the donations. Someone said Idaho snowing a lot not snowing yet man i want to go to the snow maybe next week i think next week we're going to try to go to the snow oh you know what i think we're going to try to go to the snow next week maybe i won't be live monday i forgot about that forget it maybe i will go live sunday but here's the thing who's going to watch on sunday everybody has family stuff or what if we do a chosen family watch party on sunday i would anybody watch on sunday i forgot that we're going to try to go to the snow next week so maybe i won't go live on monday what okay if i do you really want snow i know i want snow so bad that i'm gonna put it on my screen look at i want the snow i'm just gonna pretend it's snowing here okay if i do the chosen on sunday christmas who will watch it type one in the chat if you'll watch it i'll watch sunday i think everyone's gonna be a family i mean listen here's the thing who cares if only 100 people could watch it they could re-watch the replay on monday right so maybe we'll do sunday just stay tuned we might do sunday okay because there's lots of you typing ones Imagine Carl got baptized in the snow. Let's see. We could probably make that happen. There you go. There's Carl in the snow. Never thought I'd see it. Never thought I'd see it. Even Carl likes the snow. Imagine a new person clicking on the video and they're like, what in the world is going on? It's snowing and there's a bird on his screen. I'm just flexing all my nerdiness. So lots of you will watch it. Okay, maybe we'll just do it. Again, thank you for donating. We'll watch. 
My car doesn't work on the partner website. I wonder why it's not working. I wonder why it's not working. You know what, guys? I think it's time to release Carl. I think we're at the end of the year here. It's been a great year. He's been with us for a few months, but I think it's time to retire him and release him and let him fly away. Some of you didn't think he could fly, but I think tonight he flies away. I think tonight he flies away. What do you guys think? All right, Casey, thank you so much. Hannah, thank you. So thanks so much for everything you do. I love your teachings. May God bless us. Uh, thankful for you. God bless. Thank you so much, Hannah. Casey Hipshire. No, you don't want to fly away? There he goes. Goodbye, Carl. We love you. He's flying home for the winter. We love you, Carl. Goodbye. Kelly Mick, thank you so much. Uh, Casey, so I'm watching with my bonus grandmother. I ask that you will pray for her. I got your prayer request there. God bless. Thank you, Casey. Thank you so much, Kelly Mick. Warren and Donna said, so we love the verse by verse teachings. There's been no words to describe how grateful we are for you and how you've impacted your walk with our walk with God. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you so much, Warren and Donna. I appreciate you. Someone said that's a seagull. <laughs> He's a he's a dove. Okay, he's a dove. Someone said, please clip that. <laughs> Goodbye. I should have had sad music queued up. Sorry, guys. That'll be the last of Carl. Unless he decides to come home. He's gone. Freddie and Priscilla said, great teaching tonight, Isaiah. May God bless you with this offering. Thank you, Freddie and Priscilla, for always faithfully giving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are awesome. Carl is a seagull, okay? We just pretend he's a dove. Sharon, thank you so much. A great word from the Lord. Keep blazing. God bless you. Thank you, Sharon. Lucas, thank you so much, brother. Israel and Rochelle. So we're so blessed by ministry. Thank you, Israel, Michelle. Dina, Matt, I can't say your last name. Dina, thank you so much. And thanks, brother, for your obedience to the Lord. If you're giving on the website, on the Venmo, on the Zelle, I'm going to read the PayPal that's linked in the comments, and then I'm going to read the Venmo after, okay? Isaiah, have you ever seen snow? Yeah, I live like an hour, hour and a half away from the snow. Jamie Fredrickson, thank you. Cynthia Raul, thank you. Abigail Rivest, thank you so much, Abigail, for the generous, generous donation. Thank you. No, keep Carl. Okay, I'm kidding. He's staying. All right, I'm just kidding. There he is. He's here to stay, okay? Benny, Benny Schmucker, thank you so much. Said, love the Bible teaching. How does the cleansing of the temple fit in today? Thank you, Benny Schmucker. Oh, just what I taught. Jesus is still cleansing our temple. Buffering. Oh, that's lame. That's lame. Trust me, if Jesus came to the American church, I'm pretty sure he'd be driving some people out. Love the snow? I'm glad. You know, got to get the winter. Got to get the winter feelings here. All right. Maybe I should change my background to like blue or something. Too bad I don't have a... Do I have a scene that's like snow... Well, that's very Christmassy there. Okay, hold on. I wonder if there's a snow. Here's waterfall. That's kind of like, you know, that's kind of like snow, waterfall. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to I'm gonna see something real quick here. What if I download? I bet you there's a snow. A snow scene. Snow day. Let's try this one. This one's called snow day. Let's see. Oh, that's kind of cool. That one's called Snow Day. Wait, is that voice activated? Is it just white? That's not that cool. It's literally just white and a little bit of blue. Let's see. Snowfall. Let's try this one. It's not even doing anything. It's just white and a little bit of blue. Let's try this one. That one's kind of cool. That one's kind of cool. There's a whole bunch of snow ones, but they don't do anything. Snowstorm. Let's try this one. It's not going to work now. There it is. That one's called Snowstorm. That does not look like a snowstorm to me. I'm sorry. Snowing. I don't know what some of these are, but they're definitely not what they say they are. Let's go back. No, get out of here. Go back to my normal. I'm just going to keep... 
I'm gonna keep uh let's see what's this one I'm gonna keep the waterfall one I like that one the best I like that one the best that's voice activated too waterfall look most like the snow yeah that one looks coolest let me you know what let me uh are we really keeping this on I was just doing this as a joke but I kind of, I honestly kind of like it let's just tune it down a little bit though let's see let's tune it down a little bit there we go there's a little bit much here There we go. Turn it down a little bit. It was a little bit too much. All right. Shawnee, thank you so much. I always want to bless your ministry. Happy I finally can. Thank you, Shawnee. Rob Melendez, thank you so much. Anonymous, so when are you going to go write your first book? Oh, hopefully soon. I need to. I need to write a book so badly. Oh, man, I need to. 2023 has to be the year, guys. Has to be the year. Has to be the year. Someone said, love it. Glad I, I'm glad you're getting, you know. I'm glad you're getting the little, the winter vibes here. Joyce, thank you so much. Said, love your fire. Thank you, Joyce. Where's the small Isaiah? Oh, he's around here somewhere. He's around here somewhere. Okay, let's, let's pick, let's pull up the, um, pull up the Venmo, the Venmo. Again, thank you to everyone giving last Monday of the year. We will be building the studio, so all your giving will be going towards that as well. Thank you, guys. Could not do it without you, really. Okay, let's say, let's see. I'll read the messages on Venmo after. I just can't read them on stream because Venmo updated. You guys already know. Joey LeVay with the super generous Venmo. Thank you, brother. Joey LeVay, thank you so much, brother, for that generous donation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to read the comments in a second. Thank you, Anonymous. Moan Wiggins, thank you. Darian Dow, thank you. Andy Padilla, thank you so much. Christina Green, uh, Greenlaw, thank you. Judy Roman, thank you. Camille Bailey, thank you. Rob Mendoza, you're a legend. Excuse me. Gabby Hidalgo, thank you so much. Yana uh, Dav Davdenko, thank you so much. Lisa Barrick, thank you. Claire Busser, thank you. Don Allen, thank you. Bonnie Gagnon, thank you. Carissa McCarty, thank you. And Martin Montoya, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are all legends. Liz Seuss, Stephen, uh, Stephen Jacobson, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of you giving on Venmo. Zell, you guys are legends. Thank you. Couldn't do this without you guys, for real. We've been going for January will be three years. Couldn't do it without you guys. The background's cool. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. It's, it's pretty cool. It's voice activated. It's a little bit intense, but you know. The snow's a little bit intense, too. Let me turn this snow down a little bit more. Oops, that's more. Okay, there we go. That's not as intense. There we go. That's not as intense. I have a really strong feeling somebody here will eventually make a New Year's joke. All right, like the stream. Yes, please make sure you like it. It's summer here in Australia. That's crazy. It's summer there. Thank you, Anonymous, for the donation. Okay, I'm reading the chat. I'm reading the chat. All of you that, you know, come in here, false teacher, you you did have the wrong time. You should have done it now. Also, do you believe people that can, can lose their salvation? I believe you can forfeit your salvation. You can't lose your salvation like you lose your wallet or car keys, but you can definitely backslide. True, once they've always said people do not believe you can turn from God. And they say if you did turn from God, then you never were Christian in the first place. And that, that does not exist in scripture. Once they've always saved is not taught in scripture. Is water baptism necessary for salvation? No. Should we get water baptized? Yes. Is it necessary? No. We know it's not necessary because in Acts chapter 10, uh, when Philip, uh, Peter was preaching to Cornelius' household, they got filled with the Holy Spirit before they got water baptized. So unless you think unbelievers could go get full of the Holy Spirit, then no. It's not required. 2023 Isaiah becomes a best-selling author. Listen, not because I'm good to write or anything, but if we come out with a book, because it's been people have been waiting for 12 years, and because we have a large online community, it will definitely be the bestseller because all of you guys, you're gonna be the ones making it the bestseller, not me. So yeah. When are you gonna do push-ups for us? Oh man, I forgot. I gotta do some. Is drinking alcohol a sin? I believe it is, yes. And I have a video on why I believe it is. If you slip, don't slid. If you slip, don't slid. What does that mean? When you come to South Africa, oh, hopefully someday. 
What's your view on the Sabbath day is uh, cool if you keep it, but we don't have to keep a Sabbath in the New Testament. The Bible says Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And Paul said, don't let anyone tell you that you have to keep a Sabbath. So shout out to Isaiah. Thank you, Marbold. Is it okay to be baptized again? Yeah, Brown, that's fine. God will make it a base bestseller. Amen, Amy. I want to share a small monthly donation. You can do that on the web monthly. Is vaping nicotine a sin? Listen, sin means to miss the mark, miss what God wants you for your life. And I don't think God wants you vaping. Vaping's terrible for your lungs. It's bad for you. So I believe vaping is a sin. Is smoking weed a sin? I believe it is. Yes. I almost did a video on smoking weed. I'll do one soon. What is the lights you have on? I like them a lot. They are called nano leafs. I have a uh, triangle and then like, uh, what shape is that? I forget the name of it. Someone will type it in the chat, but yeah, they're just called nano leafs. And that light, that scheme is called waterfall, but there's like a million different color schemes. Audio is cutting up. Oh, I don't know why it's, it's smooth on my end. Maybe your internet's buffering. Are you going to have more babies and try for a son? Wait, who's... Is audio cutting out? Who else said that? Audio, you're breaking up. Type one if the audio is fine. Your voice is cutting out. For everybody? Really? Hold on. Am I cutting out for everybody? All right. Let's see. Check one, two. It's not cutting out on my end. Let me see. It's fine. Everyone's saying it's fine. Yeah, I don't know why. I have an audio meter and it's coming in fine. So maybe just refresh your feed. I see three or four people say it's bad, but everyone else says it's fine. So uh, just refresh your feed. It's probably buffering. Audio is perfect. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that for you. Loud and clear. Okay, cool, cool, cool. You have an echo. Oh, yeah, I have an echo because I was listening to my stream. That's why. But it should be fine now. Oh, am I having are we having more kids? Uh, I don't know. As of right now, no. But who knows what the future holds if it's God's will. Maybe we maybe we will. Are you getting the warrior shirts back in your merch store anytime? Wait, they're not there. What's, where are they? Are they not in the merch store? Let me see. These merch store guys, I have a company that does it and I'm constantly having to deal with things. I, it's constant like things going down, things not working. It gets very frustrating. Let me see. Is the warrior shirt not there? Why is it not there? Did they flag it? They might have flagged it and removed it. Let me search it real quick. Wow, it's not there. Let me do some research. And see why it's not there. That's so lame. Why do they do that? Still cutting out? Why? Let me see. Yeah, a lot of you are saying no problems. Audio is fine. I don't know if it's cutting out for you. I don't know what to tell you. Just refresh it. Do you like snow? I mean, yeah, but I don't live in the snow. Now my stream's not even loading for me. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know why the uh, thing's not there. Let me rewind it. Let's see. Yeah, it's not cutting out for me. I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Just refresh it. Yeah, it's not cutting out for a lot of people. It's good. Okay. Opinions on churches having businesses to stay open? What does that mean? Like financially? I don't think there's not, nothing wrong with having business. a business. It's fine. Okay, okay, okay. It's fine. Did you watch Home Alone yet? No, because uh, my kids, it's too scary for my kids. Home Alone is, is, Home Alone is literally, if you're a little kid 
It's super scary. I watched it growing up, but now looking back, I'm like, my kids are scared of their own shadow. And if my kids get scared of a movie or anything, then that means that they're going to be trying to be in my bed, in my room, and all that. And ain't nobody got time for that. It's perfect. Stop saying it's cutting. Yeah, I don't know who it's cutting out for. It's, it's fine on my end. You just have to refresh. That's like the worst fear is to be home alone, and there's a whole movie about it. That was like my one of my favorite movies growing up, but I, I look back, I'm like, I don't think I want my kids to watch this. It's too scary. And it's just scary if you're a four, five, six-year-old and an eight-year-old. It's breaking real bad. Okay, I don't know what to tell you. Just refresh. I like the snow falling. I thought you would. I had it as a, like an avalanche earlier, but I turned down the snow. It was too much snow. Audio's fine. Okay, the audio's fine. We're going to not talk about the audio anymore. Can't hear half of what you're saying. Just refresh. Refresh. More snow, please? You want more? It's not enough snow? You want me to turn the snow up? You want more snow? Is that too much now? Is that enough? I'm like in a straight snowstorm now. Have you ever been hit or struck by a demon in Deliverance? Yeah, I've been kicked and hit before. Your audio is never cut out once. Okay, good. It, it's it's them then. Did uh did Carl learn to fly? Yeah, he learned to fly. There he is. He's flying home for the winter. <laughs> there you go. I said someone prophesied you'll have a boy. Oh, that'd be cool. They listen. Somebody prophesied I'd have a boy and have four girls. Every single kid I have, I had a friend. Oh, the Lord showed me. I'm like, bro, don't lie. The Lord's not showing you anything. What fivefold ministry do you feel like you are? Uh, probably prophet, if anything. But I, I don't. I don't call myself anything or have a title. Thanks for teaching me about God. You're welcome. They want a blizzard. Y'all want me to get snowed in tonight. What church do you recommend in Fresno? I don't know any churches in Fresno. Is it a sin to look at Christian comedy or memes? No. Can you do a video about Catholics worshiping the Virgin Mary? I already have one on are Catholics and Christians the same. Do you like the movie Polar Express? I don't think I've ever seen it. Isaiah, you need a Satan cap. I don't know what that is. What is a Satan cap? Doesn't sound good. Is it, do you think it's okay to pray for people in the streets or only in the church? Yeah, you can pray for people outside the church. It's even better. It's raining dandruff. For real, though. Satin is a fabric. I need a, Oh, I need a satin hat. Is that what you said? You typed it as Satan. What choice of food is best during a fast? Oh, well, fasting, you don't eat any food. So I'm not sure what you mean by that. This is my favorite part of the show. I'm glad, Amari. Thank you, bro. One part of me is kind of sad. I'm like, I preach my heart out, but the other part of me is, I know, I like hanging out with you guys. This is my favorite part, too. I appreciate it, bro. Your, pro your broadcast has helped me spiritually. Thank you. What do you think about angel numbers? Oh, I'm not into them. What are your thoughts on street preachers? If that's the part of the body you are and what God's called you to do, then do it. W Jesus, amen. Is having a messy room demonic? No. I mean, it can be. Being unclean, like not wanting to shower, not wanting to brush your teeth, being like wanting to be physically unclean could be a symptom of a demon, but I don't think having a dirty room is necessarily means it's demonic. Your preaching's awesome. Thank you, Richard. Polar Express, my favorite movie. I hear the audio just fine. It's cutting out like ever the line. I don't know why. Just refresh. It's it's It must be your phone. Try a different browser maybe or a different device. Yes, Torben is still locked up. He got denied, so he's still locked up. Are ghosts demons? Yes. The word ghost means spirit, so yeah. Uh, please pray for my dad. He just saw John Mares in Glendale, and then when he left the church, he got wasted and blacked out. I don't know what that means, but I'll be praying.
What's your opinion on oneness? I'm Trinitarian, so I believe in the Trinity because the Bible shows the Trinity over and over. Lots of comments coming in. Is screaming, gagging, vomiting, yawning always evidence of a demon coming out for any of those manifestations, but not necessarily a sign that something left? Yes. Just because someone's screaming, gagging, or vomiting doesn't mean the demon's leaving. It could be a manifestation, but oftentimes they leave when you scream. Oh, he got drunk. He got wasted. Okay, I'll pray for him for sure. Oh, my audio was cutting out. I closed and reopened and now it's fine. Yeah, I don't know what that is. It must be a bug. What do you think of the rise of the Church of Satan? Oh, the Church of Satan's lame. I don't know what the Shroud of Turin is. W. Jesus L. Satan. Do you mentor on deliverance? I don't really mentor, but I have like 100 videos on it. Just to go over the stats, for some of you that weren't here of last year, our total numbers are 322 hours streamed. 1.2 million live comments came in this year. We gained 667,000 followers. We had 202 million video views total. 5.4 million hours watched on YouTube. We posted 516 videos on YouTube. And we had 430 million people see our thumbnails. Crazy. Those are the stats for this year. What's considered weakness in God's eyes? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. What do you mean like... I have a video on getting free from lust, Omar. Just search the channel. Lots of comments coming in, guys. How do you balance learnings and teachings from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. Just one's Old Covenant, one's New Covenant. God is definitely doing work through you. Thank you, Amari. Is there a good ghost? Yeah, there's a good ghost. The Holy Ghost. The word ghost means spirit. So the Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit is the same thing. But other than the Holy Ghost, no, there's no good spirits. I mean, angels are good spirits, and angels are spirits, and they're good. But other than angels and the Holy Spirit, like, if you're talking about just, like, a ghost, like a demon, no, there's no good demons. There's demons, angels, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's... Would you ever pastor again? Probably not, unless the Lord really called me. What do you, does the Bible say about animals going to heaven or hell? Oh man, y'all are going to get me in this during Christmas time on heaven and hell. My per, I've already mentioned this already. My personal belief is that pets do not go to heaven. That's my personal belief. There's no scripture saying they do or they don't. Anyone that says they know if animals, pets go to heaven, they are lying. There's no scripture. We could speculate on what you think the Bible says, but personally, I don't personally think pets go to heaven, but I might be wrong. And hopefully for your sake, I am wrong. But from my understanding, biblically, animals don't have souls, and so they can't be saved, they can't be redeemed, and they just go back to the dust. But again, that's my opinion. I don't have a scripture for you. Don't be mad at me. We can still be friends. I'm married in God's eyes. I don't know what that means. Please don't say that. I'm just giving you my opinion. You asked. You guys asked. If you think pets go to heaven, then praise the Lord. Gonna make people cry. I know people get so mad when I say this. I legit will lose like subscribers and followers right now for saying it, but it is what it is. Do you believe we all have guardian angels? Uh, I don't fully know. There's some scriptures that allude to it. I think there's angels that guard us, but I don't think that there's like one guardian angel our whole life. You know what I mean? I have a video on it. I, I'm mixed on it. What about Jesus riding a white horse? Yeah, but I don't think the white horse was his pet from earth. That's the thing. I'm not talking about animals. There will be animals in heaven, but I don't think our pets go to heaven. And if they do, I mean, there's going to be literally trillions of pets in heaven. That's what, that's what I struggle with. Like, are we going to get to heaven? There's literally just trillions of pets. Is a lizard a pet? Is there going to be lizards in heaven? Like, can you have a pet spider, a pet butterfly? Do you guys get what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to turn the snow down. It's, it's just a little bit too much here, okay? I'm getting snowed in now. You guys are getting... I'm getting snowed in. Okay, we're going to turn the snow down a bit. I believe animals go to heaven. Yeah, that's that's cool. 
What a Grinch. Oh, no, I'm not trying to be a Grinch. I'm, you guys asked me what I personally think. What choice of food is the best after a fast? Probably like chicken soup. But ask tomorrow because we're doing a video on fasting tomorrow. No insects. Okay, so see, see what I'm saying? My cousin has a pet tarantula. So is her pet tarantula going to go to heaven? And like, what happens if you're an unbeliever? Does your pet not go to heaven? Are all believers saved? Y'all see where I'm going with this. That's why I just have a hard time thinking pets go to heaven. There's a, a, there's 20 other questions you have to answer if you believe pets go to heaven. Like, what pets go to heaven? Do all animals go to heaven? Do all pets go to heaven? If I have a pet zebra, does the pet zebra go to heaven? If I have a pet bat, does the bat? What about a pet snake? See what I'm saying? I'm definitely not a Grinch. What about a pet mosquito? Do you have a video on fasting? I have several, but tomorrow night live at six o'clock, we'll be doing a video on fasting. What's your favorite movie? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really into movies. I get bored too easy. I've, it's not even just spiritual thing. I mean, a lot of movies are junk and garbage, but I'm just truly not into movies. Like, I've, I don't ever have a desire to go watch a movie or go to the movies. Like, in five minutes, I'm just bored. Someone out there has pet mosquitoes. You already know. My cousin has a pet tarantula. So, what do you mean? Of course, people have everything pet. Is your ego puffed up? Uh, what does that mean? No. In what way? Favorite documentary? Oh man, I, there's a lot of good ones. Some a pet mosquito. You already know. Somebody has a, I promise you, go to YouTube. Somebody has a pet mosquito. Somebody has a mosquito farm. They love their mosquitoes. Pet bees. Oh yeah, people have pet bees. Beekeepers. Are you kidding me? I think animals go to heaven because it's a soul tie. I don't know about all that. Do animals talk in heaven? I don't even... Again, we're opening up a can of worms here. Pet ants. Yes, people have ant farms. I was like, I wanted an ant farm growing up. Yes, people have pet ants. Have you ever seen an ant farm? Kids love that stuff. For some reason, I had this weird desire to have an ant farm when I was a kid. Core Group has a new documentary. It came out today. I saw the trailer. I don't think it came out today, but I saw the trailer. I think it comes out in January. These questions are wild. I didn't realize mosquitoes bite through thinner pants. Oh, yeah, they do. Having a pet tarantula is crazy. Yeah, my cousins had multiple pet tarantulas. I will not touch spiders or tarantulas. Pet worms. You guys are too funny. Pet roaches. Pet worms like in Dumb and Dumber. Have you ever cast out a spirit of laziness? Yes. You guys want me to put up a poll for do pets go to heaven? You guys just, you don't want to get off of this. All right, there we go. There you go. Polls up. I already know we all want our pets to go to heaven. I, I don't, I'm not asking what, I'm not giving you what I want. I'm just telling you what I think. What state country? You know, I'm in, I'm in California, United States. You're a city boy. I'm a country boy. I grew up in the country. Do a pet poll, please. I just put one up. What does it mean if you have Bible scriptures going through your head, even where you can't sleep? I mean, that's good. What is it? What do you mean what it means? It's good. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit if pets do or not. Uh, I wouldn't even ask the Holy Spirit that. It's not something that I care enough about. Did you watch? I watched Vlad's video. He thinks they do. And that's, that's, I'm not against that at all. It's his opinion. He even said that, you know, in his video, he was like, there's no explicit scripture, but this is what I think. Looks at Pet Mosquito on YouTube. Is there a video? I bet you there is. I bet you there is. OK, 
confetti and snow. That's just way too much. Let's see where the poll's at. Okay, do pets go to heaven? 57% say yes, 43% say no. So the yes is winning right now. It's at 57%. We'll leave it up a little longer. Yeah, I saw Vlad's video. I liked his video. Again, I'm giving you guys my opinion. He gave his opinion. I'm giving my opinion. He said in his video, there's no explicit scripture. I'm telling you there's no explicit scripture. We just both have different opinions. Do I have a pet? Yes, we have a dog and a cat. Do you think there are sports in heaven? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I never thought about it. Pets have feelings. Isn't that part of the soul? It's not. It is, but it's not unique to the soul. You could have feelings without having a soul. Uh, trees have trees apparently could feel pain, right? Or whatever. They're alive, but they don't have souls. Plants are alive, but don't have souls. Have you read the Passion Translation? No, I haven't. I've skimmed it before, but no, I don't read it. Is it a sin to get tattoos? For me, it is. I have a video on this. But for you, maybe not. Still 57-43. The poll has not moved. 300 votes. And there is... 1,400 people on here. Do chickens have nuggets? Uh, good question. Have you seen Bible Man unofficial trailer? No, I haven't. Have you ever been to Africa? No, I haven't. Do people go to heaven now or after the resurrection? Right now. Do you think the Holy Spirit lasted our jokes? I don't know. I'm not taking any bookings as of right now. Whatever topics you guys are asking about, you can also search the channel. Did your ex ever get saved? Unfortunately not. Her mom or her parents did, but she didn't. Or her mom did for sure, but she hasn't. From my understanding. I haven't talked to her in 12 years, so. Do you think our pets will live in the new earth? I don't know. I don't think pets go to heaven, so I don't think so. But I, I might be wrong. Might be, I might get up there and it might have a, billion, a trillion pets running around. I don't know. How many push-ups can you do? I don't know. These are all stupid questions. Well, I mean, there's no stupid questions. Do you love how funny Jesus is in The Chosen? Yeah, I do. Have you seen snow before? Yes. Still too much snow in all caps? I'm, okay, I'll try to turn it down. I'm sorry. Don't yell at me. There you go. I turned it down more. Here, I'll turn it down even more. There, I turned it down even more. No, that's too low now. That's too low now. Some people keep saying put more. So you know what? I, can't, I just can't please everyone. I'm going to tell you guys a secret to life. You can't please everyone. That's the secret to life. What determines whether you wear your glasses or not? Uh, I don't really need them this close. But I don't know. I can't see far away good. Snow's relaxing. Okay, let's let's close the poll. The final results were 57% said yes, they go to heaven, and 43% said no. So we're in the minority. We are in the minority. If you if you are like me and do not think pets go to heaven, we are in the minority. Minority. Drop down and do 20 push-ups. I'll donate $20. I could for sure do 20 push-ups. I could for sure do 20 push-ups. But I can't show you on video because my camera doesn't point low like that. So, Are you in Southern California? I'm in Central California. Let's see it push. Listen, I could do it right now, but you, but I'll have to just tell you if I did it or not. Cause I, I don't have a camera down on my floor. I can't see far away. Good. I <laughs> said 2022. Sometimes my English is just not proper. I can't see far away. Good. You did me wrong there. 
You know what? Sometimes my English is just all out of whack. It is what it is. I talk fast and I'm reading like a hundred comments a minute. You did me dirty there though. Can't see far away good. I think comments are just repeating. Who cuts your hair? His name's John. How to get delivered if my church doesn't do deliverance? Go to our deliverance map, IsaiahSaliver.com slash deliverance. So every animal goes to heaven, you're saying? If animals have perfect soul, they all go to heaven, every animal? Ooh, ice cream sounds good right now. Favorite flavor? I don't really have a favorite flavor. We love listening to you. Thanks. I'm glad. Do you know David Diga? I know Diga, David Hernandez well. I've known him for years. It's proper grammar. Well, you know, I'm talking fast, so my new favorite Isaiah quote. I don't think snakes are going to be in heaven. There'd be a trillion hamsters. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. If you say pets go to heaven, what about my pet hamsters? We actually did have pet hamsters, but I had to actually kill a few of them because it was a mess. They all started fighting, getting infections. It was bad. Heaven is big enough for pets. Okay. You, more of you are more of you think they go. So I'm the minor, minority here. Uh, what part of Mexico? I think Ensenada. But I'm like third, fourth generation. I mean, my grandparents, my dad's from the Bay Area. So he wasn't born in Mexico. He was born in California. So we're like very, very Americanized. My dad doesn't speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Yeah, I had to kill the hamsters. It was not fun because they were they were sick and dying. My dad got surgery today. They were going to amputate his finger, but they didn't after all. They just cleaned out the infection in the bone. So we're praying he doesn't have to get it amputated. Is my pet rock or pet tree in heaven? Beware false prophets. Amen. As they answer my question, I'm I'm trying. Look at all the things. Look at all the comments on screen. I'm trying to read all of them. What time is your time schedule? When do you usually start? I'm in Pacific time, so California, and I start at 6 o'clock, Nate, on Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. Uh, according to Acts chapter 10, you do not have to be baptized, water baptized to be saved because Cornelius' house received the Holy Spirit before being water baptized. Okay, guys. You're almost close to that. I know Vlad passed me up, and now I'm getting back to pass him up. He was like 40,000, I think, ahead of me, or 30,000 ahead, and I caught, I'm catching back up. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. It sounds like you don't care about animals. You guys asked me, do I think pets are in heaven? My answer is no. That's my opinion. It's not about me liking animals or not. It's about what I think the Bible teaches. I do not think it teaches pets are in heaven. Okay, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I'm going to head out. I've been live for two hours and 22 minutes. Can you have the Holy Spirit and not be saved? No, if you have the Holy Spirit, you're saved. You cannot be an unbeliever with the Holy Spirit. Do angels in heaven look like angels from the movies? No, I don't think so. Can't wait to see those 20 push-ups. What do you want me to post a video about it? You want me to do them on the green screen and then put myself on the, on the camera? So wait, do only believers pets go to heaven? Do unbelievers pets go to hell? When are you going back to Georgia? I'm not sure. People are just pouring in messages. Yeah, I, I try to read all of them. Videos bless me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Said thanks for the videos. Thanks for everything you changed in my life. Thank you, Ricardo. Jesus didn't die for pets.
All right, love you guys. I already know the moment we talk about animals in heaven and pets, it just goes off. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Last Monday of the year. Tomorrow will be the last stream. Actually, you know what? We're going to do The Chosen on Sunday, I think. We'll see. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. We will be live tomorrow at 6 o'clock. I, I would hope you be here. You probably will be. If you're still on here two hours and 20 minutes in, you're probably going to be here tomorrow. Love you guys. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for partnering, giving, supporting us. Uh, pray about our new studio. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of time, but we're working on it. Love you guys. See ya. Goodbye. Oh, hey, didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Super easy, super free, helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you and hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. It's super easy and it's super free. Do me a huge favor and hit the like button. Super easy and super free. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm yawning. It's free 99. Hit that like button. Hit that like button. I read all the PayPal. Omar, I don't see yours. I don't see your thing on PayPal. Maybe you gave on the dot me. I'll have to check it after. Super free, super easy, super fast. Do it now. Someone said I don't like pets. I literally have a bird on my screen every single week. Come on now. I don't have a choice. I have to keep the bird. I want to get rid of him, but you guys won't let me. Comment section must feel sometimes like you're running a kindergarten class. Ah, uh, you know. I could honestly sit here and talk with you guys for 12 hours, no problem. I mean, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I like talking. I like reading your comments. I like dialoguing. Sometimes I'm just tired after two hours of being on here, two and a half hours. If I wasn't preaching and like teaching, that takes a lot of brain power. It would be easy. I would just talk. But yeah, it's, I'm kind of tired by the end of it. He's dirty no more. He's born again. He was a pigeon. Now he's a dove. Oh, I'm still here. All right. I'm still here. Yes, I am still here. What is this? Why is this not working? Oh, you know what? I see the warrior shirt. I found the warrior shirt. Just type in warrior on the website. It's back. The warrior shirt is here. Actually, I need to order. I need to order this. Just type in warrior under the search. I found it. I don't know why it wasn't on the homepage. I'm gonna have to fix that. You guys are awesome. Yes, I'm still here. Supposed to be getting off, but I'm still here. How long will I stay? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe another hour. Maybe I'll be on here another hour. We'll see. Do the push-ups in the new studio? Eh, who knows? we'll see. We'll see. Oh, echo, echo, echo. Echoing, echoing. We are still here. Yes, we are still here. For those of you that keep spamming, are you still here? Yes, I am still here. Let's see. Check one, two. Ooh, check. Oh, that's weird. Yes, we are still here. Unification. 
I'm taking a vacation next week. Next week, I'm going on vacation. Well, I'm taking a week off. Kind of. Try rubbing? I don't want to rub. I do not know how to rub. Sorry. Would you go on the Joe Rogan pod just yes? Try getting saved. There's still a thousand people in here. You played too much, thank you. Yay, love the voice changers, I'm glad. As in blood pressure competition, he'd probably win. He's high on Hiawasa? What? I'm not high. What is this? Where is Isaiah? I am... Right here. It's... Selling still. Where's the bird? Oh, I'm still alive. There's still a thousand of you. Facebook, there's only 60. Georgia's and the Facebook. <laughs> Kind of creepy. Yeah, it is kind of creepy. What is that voice? I don't know. What voice? What voice? What in the Siri voice is this? This is your GPS. Alyssa, get your husband freaking. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. My legs can hurt from standing up so long. Only I was supposed to be ending. I was supposed to be ending. Yeah, here we are. Still here. These are the true fans. You guys are the real ones. Can't wait to see the push-up competition between you two. Going to be fun. Good night, everybody. Probably more people came back on. They're probably now they're like, you said you were getting off. And 300 feet, her left. Oh, that's the other voice. I've already done that before. What software is this? This is called voice mod. I mean, this is called voice mod. To Ginger during a commercial? I don't know. You sound like me and Roman on The Chosen. This is why we stay at your fault, Isaiah. You don't want to miss out on the voice changer. I hate the voices. Good night. Goodbye. I think my favorite one is Banana. Let me find it. Uh, right here. I like this one. I don't know why this one's so funny to me. For those that hate the voice changer, good night. Thanks for being here, it was a great night. If Joe Rogan invited me on, I would try to go preach to him, yes. When are you going? Probably right now. I want to hear him laugh with it. You gotta make me laugh. This one's called Banana. Chipmunk is the best. Let me find the chipmunk one. Chipmunk, where is that at? Okay, this is Chipmunk. I'm laughing so hard I'm snorting. My wife snores. You sound like an adult Chipmunk. You said you go, that was three decades ago. I know, right? Deep voice. Oh, this is a deep voice. If you did a whole sermon of that voice, I couldn't. I wouldn't do that. You gotta do something with the voice changes for real, for real? Amari is here, what? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins? Try the deep voice? Alright, let me find it. Where's the deep voice? 
Deep voice. Nope, that's creepy. Hold on. Can I find the deep voice? Where's the deep voice? Deep voice? Nope, that's not it. Hello? Is anybody in here? Hello? That's the deep voice. Nobody wants to see your private photos. Ban that person, please. Thank you. I can't stop laughing. Well, I'm glad you could laugh a little bit. This is our last Monday of the year, so, you know, just relax. It's not that serious. Try saying croaky. I don't know how to say that. I don't want to accidentally cuss. Would you do a teaching with a chipmunk voice? No, of course not. Your deep voice with the deep voice? I don't have a deep voice. I think this is the creepiest one. I'm dying laughing over here. I'm, don't die, but I'm glad you're laughing. Say a Bible verse. All right, John 3, 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. There you go. This is the best one. This is the weirdest one to me. Bro. Is that what you said? Grio, yo, yo. What? Bob Ed's right here. All right, love you guys. Goodbye. Thanks for being here. Just want to have some time to make you guys laugh real quick because you guys always beg for the voice changer and never do it. And some of you are scared of it, but God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. All right, goodbye. Good night. My stomach hurts from laughing. I'm glad it's funny to you. Didn't you say you were going to rap? Oh, uh, maybe someday. Good night. Bye.